Okay. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay, so we are also live streaming on uh, Facebook this evening. I'm Lara Maynard. I'm the Heritage Training Coordinator at Heritage NL. So welcome to our webinar on how to research your historic house from home. Um, as you I hope you have a nice cup of tea and are ready to set land for an hour or so. Um, as heritage training coordinator, I, I came on in uh, March of this year, um, during which Heritage NL has launched a new series of workshops. A lot of those have been sort of hands-on in the field type things. We've done some wriggle fences in New Perlican and Prairieland. We've done some dry stone walls in Brigus and Carbonair. Um, we've done some headstone cleaning and repair in cemeteries, um, a few cemeteries around the province, uh, particularly in Cape Royal, where there was a green team employed for the summer to do lots of really good cemetery restoration and upkeep work. Uh, we've done some foodways. We're in, in about, I think we're at number seven of 10 foodways workshops that we're doing in Mount Pearl in partnership with Admiralty House Museum. And uh, we've done a wooden window workshop. So we're, we're uh, working on all the, the traditional skills in the next couple of years in this series of workshops. We're taking a little workshop break after this webinar uh, for the holiday season, but uh, Heritage NL has just recently rolled out its craft at risk list which uh, is a list of crafts, traditional crafts in Newfoundland and Labrador, which are then listed as either viable or critically endangered or endangered. And those in, on the endangered end of the spectrum include things like spruce root basketry, um, tinsmithing, birch broom making, coopering, boat building, blacksmithing, snowshoe making, spinning, uh, and those, uh, those crafts which have been listed as at risk, we have now starting our first uh, mentor apprenticeship uh, positions with. So you can apply if you're interested in becoming either a mentor, if you have skills and experience in those types of crafts, or an apprentice, if uh, you would like to learn those crafts. So you can check that out on our website at heritagenl.ca under the program section. And later on, I will put that uh, link down in the chat box if you wanna check it out later on after Michael's talk. And I will also um, put a link to our event right page where you can keep up and follow us to learn about what workshops we have coming up, whether those are webinars like this one or things in the field or in a workshop somewhere in the province, you can follow our, our, our schedule on Eventbrite. And also a very good way to keep up on what Heritage NL is doing is to subscribe to our e-newsletter by email. And then later on, I will also put a link to that in the chat. Um, we are going to record this uh, webinar this evening. So later on, we can put it on our YouTube page or, or other places. So if you um, if you missed a note, don't worry about it. You can rewatch it. And there will be a few minutes at the end where we'll take some questions. If you want to put those to Michael, you'll be able to put those down in the Q&A section. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you uh, move your cursor over there, you should see a Q&A. And if you click on that, it'll open a panel. And you should be able to type a question in there. I'll keep track of those over the evening and we'll put those to Michael at the end of the session. I see some people, somebody has already asked where recordings like this posted. Um, they'll, the, the Facebook Live one will go straight to our video section on our Facebook page. So 
Once this is over, if you go to our Facebook page under videos, you'll be able to rewatch. And we'll, we can also post it on our YouTube channel. If you just want to have a chat amongst yourselves um, at any point during the session, you can put it under chat, as some of you already are, where you're saying hello right now. Or, but if you specifically have questions that you want Michael to be able to answer at the end of the session, put those in Q&A, please. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Bilpot, who's our Heritage Preservation Officer. No, Heritage Officer. Is that right, Michael? What, what is your title? Uh, Heritage <laughs> Officer, bracket, preservation bracket. Okay. <laughs> What's in my email? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so I'm the, I guess I'll start it off. I'm Michael, the Heritage Officer for Built Heritage. Built heritage is what that means. Um, just a second, I'm gonna share my screen now, if I can. Uh, yeah. So I, I started working on this presentation uh, more than a year ago, actually, when we were first, uh, when we first started lockdown and everyone was kind of looking for things to do and you could only really do research from home. And uh, then in the spring, we had a baby and uh, it got shelled for a while. And um, I was off for a few months. And uh, once Laura started uh, with our training schedule, it seemed like a good time to dust it off. And I, I finished it in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm glad to have you here tonight. Um, so Heritage NL, as you might also know, is the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador. We are a crown agency and our mandates to preserve the Herit rich heritage of Newfoundland and Labrador, both built and intangible. So on the built heritage side, which is my side, uh, we've got more than 330 designated buildings in the province. We also have a restoration grant program for those designated buildings. And then we do documentation and research on designation on designated buildings, as well as other properties of interest in the province. And then on the intangible cultural heritage side, uh, we deal with folklore and oral histories um, and some of the things Lara just mentioned, craft, tradition, uh, preserving and promoting intergenerational knowledge and uh, skills. And there's a significant overlap between those two, of course. So we'll start off with a disclaimer. Uh, online research is a good complement to other types of research, archival or in-person, but it's not a substitute for those. And this, this presentation will be more useful in larger centers. Uh, it's um, one of those realities, you know, in many communities, you're not even dealing with streets or street numbers that you can look up, um, um, as opposed to a, a city with, you know, papers, publishers, um, a pretty comprehensive system of street numbering, that type of thing. Uh, but I'll, I'll go over some of those limitations and what is available. So the sources I'm going to be looking at tonight, there's four main ones. Uh, the first one will be the actual house itself. The second one will be insurance plans. Uh, so that's where they're available. And they are, they do exist for I think 10 or 12 communities in the province. Uh, directories, which are community directories and business directories. Uh, I can do a phone book, except often they actually listed uh, occupation and of uh, occupants, that kind of thing and then some of the online archives that are available. And then I'll briefly touch on uh, some of the other sources, but I won't go into detail on those. You could do a series of workshops on this topic alone. Uh, and then, um, so I put together a document with links to everything I'll be talking, showing you tonight, talking about tonight and much more besides. So there's a, a link on your screen and I'll also uh, put it in the chat here in case you want to look at it now. There's a link on our website as well. Uh, all right, uh, some basic tips before we get started. Uh, take notes, you don't have to take notes on this, but when you're doing your research, uh, take lots of notes. There's nothing worse than doing a, a pile of research and then uh, 
you know, not writing down where you found it or um, retracing your steps inadvertently, you know, looking at all the same sources again, you want to know where you found information, um, write facts down with dates to them and, you know, slowly piece together a timeline. Uh, I recommend saving sources. So save a copy of the documents you're looking at, or at least the, you know, the page that has the relevant information so that you can go back to it later in case you don't write down everything that was relevant. And take your time. Uh, in most cases, you've got, you know, you've got time. These buildings have been around for decades and uh, will likely, hopefully be around for many more. Um, it can be fun and you, you, know, you can go back and do more in-depth research later. You can start with the high level stuff. I'm gonna be using a house as an example tonight. Uh, so I, I picked one that I, I was just kind of interested in myself. I used to walk by it a lot. And uh, it's not recognized, I don't think, by any level. It's not designated by us, and I don't think it's designated by the city. But uh, it's, it's on military road here in St. John's. It's home to the Association for New Canadians, a great group. Uh, yeah, so when looking at the house itself, you're looking for clues uh, about when it could have been constructed. And uh, yeah, so the form of the building can be your first clue. So some forms came, were popular in certain periods and then styles applied to those forms came in and out of style over time. And then you also want to have a close look at your building to look for change over time. So you might not learn you know, who made those changes, but you can learn how a, a house evolved. So house form, without getting into the earliest you know, buildings in the province, trappers tilt and that kind of thing, the, the earliest most of us are familiar with and that exist today are, fit into two main groups. So there's hipped roof houses uh, like this, uh, usually you know, a couple stories. A hipped roof has four sides and comes together in a peak or, or a short ridge. Often there's a central chimney, uh, like on the left. And then the other are the steep gable roof houses. So your gable is just, you know, your triangle roof shape. And then the take on the gable is the salt box, which is a, a gable with a continuous uh, slope down to the rear, which is usually a, a lower story. And then uh, earlier versions of this were usually smaller, like one story as on the left or one and a half. And then later they got larger. Uh, so here's an example of a later salt box. You can see floor heights got taller, the back, the rear linny went up uh, in height and you saw more uh, changing roof slopes and not those continuous roof slopes. Uh, you saw low slope roofs. So uh, this is around when uh, roll roofing uh, became available. Uh, much easier to install than uh, shingles on a steep pitch for, for homeowners uh, and maintenance was something homeowners could also do. You know, people, a lot of people are familiar with a lot of uh, you know, our grandparents would, would have been familiar with getting up and tarring the roof every so often. And then uh, the mansard roof house is sort of a take on the low slope. So it's got a low slope on the top with the, the bell shaped roof on the front or rear or sometimes four sides. Uh, once you get into the early 1900s, you saw variations on the low slope. So on the left here, it's a mansard roof building, but it's a uh, the door is actually, the main face is actually on the uh, end wall, unlike the other examples I showed. The middle building actually has a curved roof and the uh, building on the right, I think one of the uh, owners of the, this one might actually be in the, the chat there. Um, if I remember right, this one might actually be a low slope hip roof, but I, I haven't been on the roof and I'm not quite sure. Um, in the twenties, really starting in the twenties, you started to see bungalows, which are, one or one and a half story buildings, often with these hipped roofs. And um, oops, in mostly in St. John's, but uh, in a few other communities, you saw four square, which was popular uh, all over North America, kind of a square plan, two story hipped roof like this. Moving even later, so in the mid 1900s, uh, you saw um, changes again. Uh, so some of these have similar roof shapes, but you can see, especially on the top left, you've got, it's a much more horizontal orientation, you, we would call it. Um, on the right, you see essentially flat roofs. It's not truly flat, but a very, very low slope, with a different type of roofing altogether. Uh, you saw, um, um, 
attached houses uh, on the bottom left here, not like your traditional row of houses downtown, but uh, kind of more horizontally oriented attached houses. And then these mid pitches on the, in the lower middle there. So house style, so these are the styles that are applied to the basic forms I just went through. In the mid 1800s, uh, well, before this period, uh, you know, buildings were largely plain, often they're more utilitarian, you know, people building for shelter. Uh, but around this period, people started to express style uh, much more often. So uh, starting in the mid 1800s, we associate Second Empire with um, post-fire architecture mostly, but they, they've been in St. John's since the mid 1800s or even, and earlier, and even outside St. John's on the right is uh, House and Carbonier. Uh, also in this period, you saw um, Gothic Revival, not a, not a very common style today. Um, it may have been in that time, um, but th this is usually the period you see them. Um, some characteristics are this steep roof slope, this barge board, we call it in the gable end, um, or gingerbread sometimes called, um, peaked windows, arched windows, like on the left, bottom left there. Um, so you can see some heavy trim around the windows on the bottom right there. Late 1800s, you saw a sort of refinement, I guess, of the Second Empire style, more of these uh, bonneted dormers. This is in Bonavista on the left. Um, and you can see uh, more ornate trim there below. And on the right, larger Second Empire building, this is uh, in Red Cliff. And again, you, you see it running trim along the, above the windows there. And then you also saw um, Victorian architecture. So this tended to be eclectic. It might mix several styles. On the bottom left, you see some of the Gothic elements I just mentioned, barge board, there's a, a pointed finial on the top, uh, but on the same house on the middle bottom, you've got a rounded arch window, which is more classical or and clapboard on the bias, as, as we call it, diagonal clapboard. And then on the bottom right, you see uh, they've got heavy brackets, not just on the lower eaves, but in the gable end as well. In the early 1900s, and you saw a more classical revival. Um, so some of the elements of this style are uh, pediments or takes on the pediment. So we'll think of a classic Greek temple, the triangular roof. Uh, so here you can see there's a, it's emphasized the roof of this one in a pediment style and also above the doorway. Uh, craftsmen often applied to bungalows. Uh, you can see one feature here is the exposed rafters coming out. You can see them under the uh, dormers. Often they had uh, some big, large columns, uh, square columns, and, and uh, sometimes large brackets as well. Then on the bottom, a lot of us are familiar with Queen Anne buildings. We have some very fine examples in the city. So these were also in the early 1900s. Um, a lot of bay windows. You see these curving, uh, see the curving wall and the uh, tower on the bottom left there, and uh, just very fine detail. And getting into the mid 1900s again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it, things started to get more horizontal. So on the bottom, uh, a very low building, even the windows are wide rectangles as, as opposed to the tall rectangles of earlier buildings. Um, at windows on corners is something you saw. And then even later in the post-war, you saw what's called victory housing, and these are in several communities, Newfoundland and Labrador. Other elements you can look at, uh, details on a house. So depending on how many divisions your window, if you have original wood windows, depending on how many divisions they have, it can give you a clue. So earlier houses would typically have more divisions, often six over six windows. Um, and then gradually there are fewer and fewer panes in your window. So uh, it became originally, you know, it was harder to ship uh, large pieces of glass in the early days. It was also harder to make larger sheets of glass 
uh, and as technology evolved, windows got larger and then eventually becoming picture windows and those corner windows. Uh, and then by window details, I mean by looking at the, uh, so the divisions themselves, the, uh, the profile that's put on them, uh, and I'll show you an example in a second. Foundations, um, if you have a stone or brick foundation, it is likely you know, at least 100 years old. Uh, and then early concrete, you, you can often see in the pattern that's on the surface. So sometimes they were etched with a, something to imitate stone. Uh, other times they were formed with boards as opposed to plywood. Um, the board form you would see into the mid 1900s, but uh, the stone style you would see usually earlier. And this is what I mentioned by window profiles. So uh, this, this would be the shape that you see on the inside of your glass on a wood window. These dates aren't local. This is uh, from the United States, but I, I have seen you know, styles like this in these periods. Um, the style on the left there, which is in a very early period, you actually see in reproduction windows as well. So it's not always a great clue, but uh, four, six, and nine are, are similar styles are seen there. And then, yeah, observing change. So going around your building and looking up close. Uh, so looking at window styles, if one side of your building has six over six windows and another side has two over two, and that, that's uh, two panes on top, two panes on bottom, uh, it's likely that they could have been installed in different times or sometimes, Sometimes finer windows were put on the front, say. Um, looking for seams and clapboard. If your clapboard is old, there might be a, a continuous line as opposed to staggered joints that shows you where a change was made. Looking in unfinished spaces like attics and uh, basements usually, but any other unfinished spaces, or if you're opening up walls, you might look for, for clues to changes, like changes in types of the foundation, so if there's a stone foundation and a concrete foundation, that's a pretty good clue. Um, molding profiles, looking at your trim inside, if trim in one part of the house is different from another part, it's a good clue that there were renovations done at a certain period in time. And then con construction methods, if you're, if you are opening up your building, for instance, and you find wall, your walls are filled with studs as opposed to studs and, and spaces, uh, that would be called full studying, and that's an older type of construction. Uh, after that, you would see you know, logs often that were flattened on two sides and later milled stud, stud construction. So a few examples of uh, noting styles and changes. So here is a, is a building in a house in Fortune Harbor. As I, like I mentioned, you can see that one, one side has a three over six window and one side is a two over two window. So uh, I would guess that a house like this was built like with six over six windows on the front as well, but maybe those were placed at a, at a later, but still an early date uh, to have a two over two window. And they would usually start on the front as that was you know, the, the showpiece. Here's a designated building in Port de Grave. Um, you might think this is a, a small mansard roof detail, but it's known there that the, um, the roof was actually cut down. Uh, and this made, of course, heating and, as I, like I said earlier, maintenance easier. Now, this is a building in Redcliffe. So uh, the back, what you can't see here is actually a storefront that was built on an earlier house. But if you're on site, you would see a very clear line in the clapboard that actually traces the shape of the original roof. And then another uh, seam in the clapboard lying down the back. and. Um, I believe that there was like an addition on the on the right hand side there at one point. This is a an attic, the attic of landfall in Frigus. You can actually see the line of the old roof. So at some point the roof was raised, and here you can see that full, full studding. So under that line, uh, those are studs placed side by side. There are no voids in the wall. The original house. So uh, looking at uh, the example house here. Uh, it's uh, got a fairly steep roof slope, so we might think it's, you might think that it, uh, in the 1800s, uh, potentially. Uh, so what are our other clues? Uh, on the right, you can see that there have been additions over time. So maybe that inner line that you can see, uh, that might be part of the original house, but it's been expanded 
at least a couple of times. There's uh, an addition, two story addition to the left of that. And then there's a further, looks like one story addition to the left of that. Uh, looking at the, the style. So th this is a, a very rare example of board and batten siding in uh, St. John's or in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and you saw this in other places on uh, Gothic buildings. Uh, but this one is more an eclectic style. It's got uh, the trim here is almost like stick work, like you might see in a two-door revival kind of building. So it could be of that Victorian period, or sometimes uh, detail like this was added on to an earlier house. That's that uh, trim I was talking about. And then if you are in St. John's and downtown, uh, one extra check you can do is to see um, if, if your building could have survived the fire. And in this case, uh, it, the fire came to its doorstep. So it's, it, there's a good chance it's a pre-fire house. And then going back even further, um, this is the extent of the 1846 fire. And again, so it's not actually, the house isn't on this map. And not all uh, buildings are, of course, on the, on the extremity here. Um, it was, so it was likely built after the 46 fire, but if it was there, it could have survived. So what have we learned about the example house so far? These, these would be things that I would be writing down along the way. Um, so it probably predates the 1892 fire based on the form, the steep roof and the, the, the style of it. And it may, it may, it could predate the 1846 fire based on form, but there we have some evidence that it was not there. Uh, so the first uh, archival source that's available online that I'll go through are insurance plans. So these are available for uh, maybe a dozen communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, in other regions, you might be familiar with Sanborn maps, a very similar thing. So this is the, the title sheet that you would see when you open one up shows you the, the city when it was recorded. Um, can you see my mouse, by the way? Yeah, Clara, do you know? Yeah. Mm, no. No, I can't. I don't, I don't know if there's a way to get a pointer on this. Anyway, um, there is, so there is a date under the title there. It shows you the population. Uh, under those, it shows you who drafted it. These are Goad. This is by Charles Goad. On the bottom Michael, right. Yeah. I think we can see your mouse. It just wasn't moving on the screen at the time. We see okay. it now. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah. So these are, this is who drafted it. They, this is your key down here. So you'll see annotation on the, the larger sheets. And this is how you'll interpret it. So you're looking at the layout of the community and you'll want to, you can zoom in. There's quite a bit of detail that shows street names and everything, so you can pinpoint the location of your building if you're in a mapped community. Uh, so I know I know the house is on this corner here. So so this is saying that this number in the middle of the shaded part is telling us it's the larger detail is on sheet 15. So if we move to sheet 15, uh, you can see a larger version of what we were just looking at. Um, and our building is on the corner of Barron's Road and Military Road right here. So it did exist at the time of this map in 1914, of course. Uh, so zooming in again, there's our house. We can see, so uh, this is, we're looking at 144 Military Road, but we're, we can actually see now that it was numbered 114 Military Road in, eight, in 1914. So that's something uh, important to note. Uh, something unusual on this one that I, I'm not, I still don't know what it means exactly, but this, the, the building next door actually has the same street number, so it could be related in some way. Um, yeah, or it could be an error, but maybe we'll see. So interpreting this using the key, here's a blown up version of that. We can see that it's yellow, so it was built with wood and it still is. You can see the number that's written on the footprint is the number of stories you have, two and a half. So that's what it's still is today. You can see here are roof types. So if it's not noted, it would usually be a shingle roof if it's a C pitch. But you can see on one of the additions that there's a composition roof. 
And the other thing you can do, so if there's several insurance plans, as there are in St. John's and a few other communities, you can compare them. So on the right is the 1893 plan. Looks pretty similar, look, uh, looking briefly, but if you look closer, so on the right, there's no bay window on the left side. And on the top, there's a dashed line on, uh, there. So that could indicate a change in a, a veranda or something, and maybe the bay was added after the 1893 map. So what have we learned from insurance maps? Um, so it did exist as of 1893. We know that for sure now. Uh, this is what we learned earlier. Uh, it was number 114 until at least 1914. It may be related to that shop with the same street number. And a bay window and veranda were added. I said a veranda was added, but actually looking at it again, I think that I might be wrong about that one. But a bit, it looks like a bay window was added. Uh, the next source I'll go to are directories. So uh, there are a few different types of directories. Uh, there are community and business directories. Uh, so these, unlike the insurance plans, which are only available for larger communities, um, community directories did cover quite uh, a broad number of communities in the province. Now, again, they in St. John's uh, and maybe communities like Harbor Grace, they may have street numbers and streets. In other communities, they would usually just list the head of the household uh, of each particular household and, they, and the businesses in the community say. So you would need, it is harder to research buildings in an outport, so you would usually need something to go on, you know, the name of one previous owner, for instance, that you could start with, start tracing things. Like I said earlier, usually the earlier directories had wider coverage. Uh, there were fewer people to record, so they recorded more communities. The other types are telephone directories. So there are a lot of these available online as well in the late 1900s. And these can be used to trace uh, residency. Uh, so if you go through the directories and look at and, and check names and, and search your street address, you can start to see when people moved into or left an address. And then there are censuses. Uh, which I, I'm not going to go into detail, but there are the censuses of 1921, 35, and 44 do include whole households, but they don't they don't have street numbers, so you do have to figure out who was in the, the household at least to, to really use those. Uh, so community directory, directories. I, I recommend starting with information that you know. So we, we know that the street address was 114. Uh, before 1914. So usually I try to start uh, with a directory from around that period in time. And then I usually go forward and backward from there. If you, if you jump around, you might find it hard to connect the dots. Uh, so I usually go sequentially. Um, before I go to that, uh, I will pull up a, uh, one of the directories here. So this is the document I sent the link for, and I, I've got most of this stuff listed. Um, so the one I actually started with was the 1894-97 McAlpins. Um, so if you open it up, uh, it brings you to Munn's DAI. And you can search in here. Um, there are some limitations to this search. Uh, so if you search 114 military, it'll search for 114 and military, not necessarily those two together. So you can see I actually get seven results uh, searching this way. And the first one, it highlights it for you, uh, 120 military. So these, these aren't the ones. Um, if you click filtered here, it'll just show you those pages with hits. But if you check your other pages, um, you might, so the second page I checked here, is 114 military, and we can see that uh, at, in 1894-97, somewhere in there, a Morris Green, a builder, lived at 114 Military Road. So this is the same thing that we just found, and I would usually save a copy of that page. Um, you can go download and then save a copy that way on Mons DAI. So I'm just gonna run through some of the things I found going through the directories and talk, uh, uh, just comment on them. So 
in that one we found that it was more a screen, a builder. And that's kind of that's kind of an interesting uh, detail to me that he was a builder. So it's possible that you know his, he used his own home as kind of an advertisement for his services, trim like that, uh, details like that. I uh, moved. I moved forward first. So next, I went to an 1897 directory, which had the same information. Uh, I also found at 114 military uh, Geerge Hayward. Now, this the Geerge is probably a typo. It's probably a George Hayward. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. He could he could have been boarding at the house. Uh, he doesn't come up later, so I I don't know for sure. It, it could also be an error uh, in the address, but still good to note, you don't know when it'll come back. Moving forward to 1904, uh, actually found Morris at 114 and a half. Uh, so that's something to unravel. And it's, instead of Morris at 114, there was Arthur Muse. So if we'll keep going and if you see, if things will start to you know come together. So in the next directory is Arthur Muse again, so we can, Kind of assume that at some point uh, between 97 and 04, Arthur Muse moved into 114 military. Uh, Morris is no longer uh, listed there. And in 1913, again, Muse is there. In 1924, uh, I looked up Muse and he had moved to a different address. And instead, James McKenzie is there. In 1928, uh, McKenzie is still there. In 32, he is still there. And in 36, uh, we have another change. So W.J. Murphy, uh, that name might be familiar to some people, uh, owner of grocery stores, including one a couple doors down from the house. So it would make sense that he would uh, buy this. And this is uh, an interesting listing. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Keegan was also listed as uh, residing there. So um, he isn't listed there later, as far as I know. So that's another question. So that's something you, you'd want to look into as you're doing your research and likely his wife, wife or daughter. And then uh, in this period, Murphy is listed there in one spot, but he's actually still got a house on Torbay Road, in the same directory. But later, uh, as you can see, Murphy remains at uh, 144 until beyond the 60s at least. Uh, so I went back to, 90, 1894, and then I started to go backwards. So going back from there, I found that a TJ Green at 114 Military, an accountant. So it could have been before someone before Morris. Uh, but going back even further, he Mor Morris or Maurice, I guess, is uh, still listed in 114 Military. So TJ could be uh, a son or a, or a, another relative of the Greens. In levels of 1871, there's a, a Miss Catherine Green who's actually a widow of Maurice or Morris. Um, so this is obviously not the later Morris uh, who would have been dead by that time. So the earlier Morris was likely a uh, likely the father of Maurice we've seen elsewhere. And then even before that, I found no records for this address, 114 Military. Uh, but I did find two Maurice Greens, uh, one a boot and shoemaker on Duckworth and one a master mariner on Garrison Hill. So I, I got the impression that it, it was likely the second Maurice, Maurice there that uh, was um, Catherine's wife and the other Maurice's father lived nearby um, and uh, more likely to have moved up. So what have we learned so far? Yeah, well, it definitely predates 1885 now, and it may, may predate 1871. It was renumbered somewhere in this time period. The bay window was added. Um, it belonged to the Greens in early years. The one thing, I've got E in brackets, one thing you'll find is that uh, for some names, there were variations on spelling. So sometimes you have to look up multiple versions of a name. Uh, later, a house of uh, Arthur, Muse, uh, Keegan, and Murphy. So the next one I'll go to uh, are online archives. So there are a few. The, the most 
I, the one I find most useful are the digital archives at MUN. Um, the, the rooms also has some material digitized on, on their website. Newfoundland's Grand Banks is a community developed archive uh, and website. So it's not affiliated with the museum or a physical archive. And then there are community archives. So some like the city of St. John's has things online, but uh, you can request other things by email. Um, the Conception Bay Museum, they post a lot of stuff on social media and I believe you can request things from there. So often you can request things even if you can't go in. And then there, there is the Library and Archives Canada, which is national. So you're less likely to find something on a, you know, your run of the mill house, but uh, sometimes you can find a photo of a community or a map that might be useful. So uh, I'll go most into detail on the Digital Archives Initiative. So you can, I would search by address as well as uh, the individual or the family who live there. I'll show you the advanced search fun functions. You want to pay attention to document year. So some, uh, in some years, that certain information will not apply. So looking at 144 military before 1924 won't get you what you want. Um, you want to, when doing searches, you don't want to put in street usually because uh, that'll limit you in case it's abbreviated a different way. And then you want to try different combinations of terms. So trying the, the full address, the full name, uh, combination of a name and address, depending on how many search results you get on your first one. If you get too many, you can add terms to uh, limit your results to hopefully the more relevant ones. I'll show you that. I'll show you briefly. So this is the front page of the MUNS Digital Archives. So I, if you search up here, you can search. Um, it'll do. It'll search for all the terms, but not necessarily a specific phrase. But if you click Advanced Search just below that, it'll bring you here. And you can uh, like type in, say, the name, the person we we know lived there at one point. And on the right, you can choose how it searches. So uh, I would start with, say, the exact phrase to see what kind of results that gets you. And then you click search down below. And so we got 26 results on that one. That's not too many. So you might go through each of those and, and uh, see if it has any relevant information. Or you could, you could narrow it down even more. Uh, but going in into here, see they've uh, it shows that we have two results in this document uh, sometimes it highlights it for you and other times i found that uh, it does not but if you try searching say just maurice or just green it might it might show you what you want so you can kind of pinpoint where it is on your page and then you can either download download it like i showed you before or you can zoom in by clicking uh let me just click there view I think and then you can scroll in until you find uh, where your search result was highlighted and here you can see so our builder Maurice Green uh, was building other houses a nice house on Gower Street for Jeremiah Halloran uh, so this is probably the right guy he's a builder I, I think we can pro probably add that to our history for the house so Doing a few searches, these are some of the things I found. So searching 144 military, uh, there was actually a photo from the geography collection at MUN. Uh, so this is this is like the jackpot if you can get something like this. Uh, here's our house on the left. Um, some of the detail is still there, even more detail that hasn't survived. So this ornate uh, port or veranda on the front and uh, cresting on the top of the roof, finials and more. Uh, detail in the gable end there, but otherwise, you know, it's pretty pretty well preserved over time. Uh, so you you might find newspaper hits, uh, and you'll find this outside St. John's too, outside larger communities, uh, usually in sometimes in other newspapers. So there's there were newspapers in Twilling Gate and Corner Brook, the Western Star, and the Twilling Gate Sun. I'm usually searching fam family names rather than addresses, of course, like I said before. So some of the things that came up, popped up on this one, um, it almost burned down at one point in 1990. Um, he's responsible for some other building projects up here. 
you'll, you'll often find things like weddings or, or wakes that were hosted at an address or ads looking for uh, domestic help, that kind of thing. Um, other ones that came up, um, searching some of the other names that we found, so searching Mackenzie, uh, you can see a profile that was done of him in 1927. On the bottom left, this is a good one. Uh, so Mrs. Miss Wendland Muse um, was an artist and taught, uh, taught from the building. Uh, so that's a great bit of information. And then a photo of Murphy's store down the street. And on the right is from Streetscapes. Uh, this was done in the 80s. Many streets in St. John's were photographed and put into, into books. And that's in the document that I shared around. Uh, so this is a photo of going to Baby No Day at the time. So uh, going to the rooms, the, these links are in the document I shared. I usually find it most helpful to search keywords with ser which searches multiple fields. So you can search, you might get hits on names associated with the house. Uh, they have a lot of military records, for instance, uh, or you might get photos of a community that might uh, give you a photo of your house. Uh, Newfoundland's Grand Banks. This is, so there's a website. Um, navigation across the top there. Uh, birth dates, marriages and wills, I believe BDMW is. So there's, there's quite a bit of information there. And it, it also has a search feature on the bottom, which works like a Google search. Um, so what have we learned from our, our archival work so far? Uh, on this house, we learned that it probably predates uh, 1871 um, was renumbered. The bay window was added. Uh, it was present of all these people. Well, that was what we knew before, but we, we filled in some of the other stories. We could do a write up on this building now and actually tell something of a story. Um, other sources you'll want to look at. When you have some names, you can look into genealogy to check out family trees. Uh, sometimes there are photos associated with those. Family History Society of Newfoundland and Labrador is a great resource. They've got a, you can, they've got an annual membership that gives you access to a number of documents on their website, quite a few actually. Their, their uh, description of their holdings is I think more than 200 pages, so they have quite a bit. Uh, fam, family Search is a free online an ancestry kind of website, and then there's Ancestry, which is paid and other sources. Inventories and social media. Oh, briefly uh, mention those. So this is a family search. I use this sometimes. Um, you can search, I usually search by either family tree or record. Sometimes a tree already exists and it saves some work and sources are uh, attached to those trees. And again, you start with basic info, so a name or a place of residence or a mother or father or a place of death. Uh, in this case, I searched Maurice, Maurice Green. Uh, I found one in St. John's in the right time period. His father was also Maurice, so that lines up with what we found. Uh, Mother Catherine lines up with what we found. And they, so they don't have any of their children, if they had any, um, but they do have uh, Maurice's siblings in this family tree. Inventories, so inventories are documents uh, that are based on field, architectural field work. So you go into a community and you record everything that meets certain criteria. So say that you might believe that it predates 1900. So you photograph it, document it, write down what information you can find and put it into a book for future use. So it usually provides a rough date, might provide a historic owner or a current owner and a picture at a certain point in time. Uh, these are, I've got a bunch listed in that document. So they're available for uh, some communities in some larger regions. Uh, the gaps are uninventoried communities and it's based on criteria set at a certain point in time. So even though more stuff might be say 100 years old today, it wouldn't include that stuff or later period features. So this is what pages from an inventory look, might look like. Uh, a photo, there's a little plan on the bottom right and some basic information. And you can use this to hopefully do further research. Social media, uh, I'm not gonna go into depth, you're likely all familiar with social media, but uh, I've included the names of a lot of the community history groups I know of in that document. And a good place is to start, the, 
the more local groups. Uh, social media is widely used um, and yeah, there's pretty passionate communities. And then some of the more general groups have a very wide reach. And I'm always surprised by what you find, like I'd like to communicate with someone, some relative of a person and then who knew uh, the niece or nephew of that person, of course, comments and says, talk to me, I have information. Um, so, yeah, so uh, putting together uh, what we learned so far about the example house um, owned by the Greens until since at least 1871, it might have been built by Maurice Green. Um, that would be something I would guess as a, as a builder. Um, Later home of Arthur and Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn could have been his uh, daughter as well. Um, home to James Mackenzie later, W.J. Murphy. And so what kind of things are missing after doing this kind of research? Uh, the, the first one, of course, is, uh, women are often missing from historic documents, especially these directories. It's usually uh, only the the male head of household that's listed, unless there is, a, unless they are a widow or they have a, a business of some sort, they might be listed. Um, and the same is true of many historic documents, unfortunately. Uh, specific sources for outports, like I mentioned already, you don't have those street addresses, so you have to do more, more general searching first. Labrador. Uh, they are included in the provincial and national collections, the archives, and MUNS DAI, but the I don't know of any insurance plans or directories that cover Labrador, but there are, there are more sources online. I know Them Days Magazine has a dedicated uh, archive building. And then intangible values, you might come across some stories in newspapers on a uh, house, but you really need to talk to people to get uh, the juicy details. So uh, when it's safe, please do tell. Please do so, talk to past owners, uh, neighbors, um, yeah, uh, take to social media. And that is all I have for tonight. That's a very quick and uh, high level view of things. You, like I said, you could probably do 10 workshops on this going into greater detail. So if there are any questions, I will try to answer them. Uh, one of the questions that somebody had was, when were bay windows thought to be added to homes or as part of the style? I know they've been around for about as long as windows have been around. I can picture them in Tudor style houses. I can picture them in my aunt's 1970s split level. Is there a particular uh, local building period that you associate bay windows with? Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I'm, I don't know of many, I haven't seen many before, you know, the, the mid 1800s, uh, though I have seen at least one etching from around that time that seemed to show a bay window of a house I was researching once. But uh, earlier buildings were usually more uh, utilitarian, so you, you wouldn't build more than you had to. Uh, anyone who's been upstairs in an older house, uh, especially on airport, probably knows that. They didn't build taller than they had to or or more complicated than they had to, to make shelter. But uh, definitely in the, the late 1800s, especially, you know, around the Queen Anne, Second Empire periods, they were very common. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher asks, specifically bay windows added to hip roof houses. Um, pretty specific. I'm not sure I could be that specific, yeah. Uh, <laughs> show me the house, send, send us an email and I might be able to help. Yeah. Um, a bunch of people asked about the uh, maps of their online. So again, have a look at that uh, document that um, Michael sent out. It has a bunch of links in it. So there are some insurance plans linked in there. There are maps and other plans linked in there. There are heritage inventories linked in there. The digital archives initiative at MON is linked in there. And um, towards the end of that document, he has a bit of a list of by community, which you'll be able to find some information about uh, a particular area that you're looking for. 
Yeah. Um, I would I note think... on that one. So the, the community listing, um, I did not list the early directories cover uh, dozens, if not hundreds of communities. So I didn't uh, make a, a bullet point for each of those communities. So I, you should check the directories as well if you use that community list. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, there's a note there at the top. Um, and Michael, could you maybe just comment on the challenge of uh, doing research on buildings in rural areas versus the more documented areas like St. John's? Uh, sure. So it, there's no doubt it is more difficult. You usually need some piece of information. Uh, you know, a, an owner. You know, perhaps who you bought it from. If you if you bought it, if you're not, you know, you might just be in researching a house you're interested in. But trying to get an owner's name, I, often they will be found in the, the censuses or the directories. Uh, your on-site work will be a lot more important. So you'll want to go around with your magnifying glass and look for clues about construction details, whether your boards are milled or rough sawn. Um, you know, often you do see newspapers and walls, that kind of thing, which can tell you um, when certain details were added. Um, uh, check the, there are a decent collection of photographs on Mun's website, the geography collection. If you search your community, sometimes you'll find uh, photos of, you know, your building might be in the background of a, of a photo. Here's an interesting uh, comment. Um, and it was one that I was thinking about when we were planning for this evening. Somebody says, we found items over the years in walls, things buried, etc., with names and dates on them. Um, that's also sometimes a clue to the age of the building, although I guess sometimes those things can be misleading. Yeah, yeah. So people, sometimes people add their names um, when they do a specific bit of work. So I've seen it on roofs where a roof was re-roofed. Uh, you might see who installed it. Um, but yeah, in terms of the whole house, uh, like often, sometimes, not often, I guess, but sometimes in the, in the basement, a crawl space or under a stair, you might see that written by a builder. And then that'll give you a good name. Um, yeah. Or newspaper installation. Yeah, that one's less, you know, it's, it's not accurate, but it can give you a, a ballpark. You know, it couldn't have been put there before that date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't know if they're, how long they were left there, if they're added later. Yeah. Um, Patrick asks, when did the period balloon frame construction end? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know in Newfoundland when balloon framing fell out of favor exactly. Um, like certainly the earlier uh, salt boxes and things would be uh, have continuous studs, but I don't know when the most buildings would have transitioned. I haven't, we see a lot of building restoration, but usually we're not taking apart the walls to that extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christopher asks um, about sunroom renovations. He says there seems to have been sunroom renovations during the late 1800s. So I guess he means either renovations or additions, people building on sunrooms. Yeah, uh, yeah, likely, likely the late 1800s. Uh, so I, I know a few in St. John's and there were I know there was at least one in Harbor Grace, a large one, um, or a conservatory. And so that would have required, you know, lar larger pieces of glass and uh, a good bit of metal work to keep the, uh, to keep the rain out with that much glazing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that would have been something uh, later 1800s for sure. I, I don't know when that would have started. More questions. Uh, somebody asks, what records, did we do this already? What records exist for 1800 to 1830 outside of St. John's area, specifically Trinity? 
Good question. Uh, I think the historical society might have an earlier map of the community, but I don't know what period it's from. Uh, sometimes things are mentioned in merchants' diaries. So we, we recently found a clue in the Slade and Kelson diaries. I think it was those. Um, so a building that's designated in Trinity. Uh, we, we thought it was probably an 18, if I'm getting my dates right, an 1830s building. Uh, but we found a, a reference to um, of a house in the area burning down in 1817 or 1814. And it was the same family name and everything. So we kind of assumed that it was the earlier house and then it would have been rebuilt shortly after that period. So sometimes you see references like that of something was happening with a building in a community in the in Merchant's Diaries. Ryan also has diaries on the DAI. Okay. Uh, for people who are asking about uh, Michael's resource document and you're trying to copy the, the, the link but having trouble, I can email that out to you. So everybody who has registered tonight, I can send out that, um, that document link by email and that way you'll have it handy in your email and you can access it straight from there. Mm -hmm. This is a, there's a shortened version there too. I think it still works. A couple of more construction related uh, questions and then we'll wrap up for the night. Uh, one is when was full studying ended? Um, I get, again, it's hard to pin down an exact date. Uh, different parts of a province developed in different periods. Um, um, the buildings I've seen that have been full studded have mostly been pre-1860, I guess, by 1850s, maybe. So I, I, would, I think it was a trans transition around that period. Mm -hmm. And Patrick asks, um, what period does hand-forged nails, the square iron kind, indicate? Uh, he says, my house has some of those. And when would Newfoundland have transitioned to machine-made nails in construction? That's a good question. And I could get you more uh, detail on that. because We actually had a manufacturing, a nail manufacturer in the, in the province. Uh, so it'd be, we could find out when they, when they started up. They were making, I think, mostly wire nails. Um, you know, nails were imported for most of the 1800s, late 1800s anyway. Early, uh, one of the other earlier construction details is uh, our trunnels or tree nails. So that would be a nail made of wood. So a hole would be bored in wood and a wooden peg put into it rather than a steep, an iron nail. Um, but yeah, uh, forged nails would have been probably, you know, later 1800s or before, before 1900, for sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And thanks for everybody for coming. Michael, is there anything you wanted to add before we sign off? Um, I think that's all. Um, you know, in, enjoy it. Let us know if you do find things. So we do have a, we've got a, I had it on the last page there, but we do have a Facebook group for Built Heritage. You, you can post in there. I, I think it's set up so that we can review them beforehand to make sure they're on Built Heritage and, and all kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, feel free to share things there or uh, yeah, you can send us an email if you find anything in particular or if you have any more questions, please get in touch. Yeah, and I will, I'll follow up with an email. Uh, everybody who's here tonight, you would have registered through Eventbrite and I can send you an email back to Eventbrite with my goals document again and with uh, a list of our social media and our, our, um, our newsletter again in case you want to sign up and our Eventbrite homepage so you can keep track of our workshop offerings in the new year. Thank you everybody and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much everyone. Good night. Good night.